Welcome. We have a wonderful audience with us today. We're here for an exploration of life after Invent Teams. We have our 2017 Invent Teams with us. Can you guys make a little bit of noise? Wonderful. Um, this morning, our Invent Teams presented their projects to their peers, and this afternoon, they're going to be showcasing their inventions to the public. So I hope all of our visitors can hang out uh, and uh, look at these uh, fabulous inventions that the students have brought to us from all over the country. We also have Excite Award recipients here in our audience today. Excite Award recipients, a little bit of noise. Excite Award recipients are teachers who are also um, here as finalists for next year's Invent Team grants. So it's our pleasure to actually show the uh, finalists what fun this year's Invent Teams have had and um, to help them understand what we mean when we talk about invention education. So welcome to the Excite Award recipients. I'm very pleased to have Invent Team alumni their family and friends with us. I know a lot of you are sitting over here. Yay! <laughs> we have some Lemelson MIT Student Prize winners with us. We welcome them to our audience. We have folks from the Lemelson Foundation among us. And we even have a representative from the US Patent and Trademark Office with us. Thank you, Joyce, for being here. So welcome, everyone. I think most of you know me, but just in case you don't, my name is Lee Estabrooks. And it is my distinct pleasure to be the Invention Education Officer for the Livingston MIT program. Our program celebrates inventors and inspires youth. Eureka Fest is one of our ways of celebrating and inspiring these young inventors. I often wonder, though, who is inspired more? The youth or me? And I think it's me. Um, these young people inspire me with their curiosity and their empathy, their hard work and dedication, their perseverance and their poise. These are not problem solvers and leaders of tomorrow. They're problem solvers and leaders today. And I applaud them and thank you for inspiring me. In this next hour, we'll celebrate three former invent teams whose inventions have reached milestones. Following the recognition of inventions, we'll hear from invent team alumni. And they're going to tell us about their journey since being here at Eureka Fest. So let's celebrate. Today, the Limelson MIT program would like to recognize three inventions and teams of inventors who have done extraordinary things. They've moved an invention to commercialization, and some of them have also received US patents. We first want to recognize Sturgis West Charter High School from Hyannis, Massachusetts. This is not just one invent team. This is at least two invent teams. <laughs> How many? Uh, OK, Tom. OK, so they, these, um, these are invent teams who have been working since 2013 to make their dolphin cart real. The cart and several of the teams will be at the showcase later on today. And I really do encourage you to go see what an invent team project ready for commercialization looks like. I understand that it was still being polished at 10.30 last night. Thank you for having it here with us. Dr. Pete, Pete Sampu, will be accepting an award on behalf of the Sturgis Invent Teams 
who refused to give up on their good idea. Dr. Pete? Thank you so very much. It's been a great pleasure learning um, about your team. They were kind of a, a sleeper team, maybe. Um, I didn't even know that they were still working on the project until I think it was, is, is Mark here? Oh, Mark. Uh, Mark, Mark through Paul called and said, hey, we need some SolidWorks licenses. And I'm going, you do? Um, so anyway, it is through working through Mark. Hit up, Mark. Okay, Mark. And the rest of the, let's see, let's have the new team, the recent team stand up. And we have two members from the original team. We have Dominic and Molly. And Dr. Pete, I understand there's going to be a celebration on the Cape this summer in July, and I'm going? Yep, yep. I, I mean, a dolphin card isn't any good unless you got a real live dolphin in it. And we have this arrangement with uh, International Fund for Animal yeah. Welfare, who helped us fund the second part of the development here, and we will be donating the finished dolphin cart for actual use on Cape Cod, and the in solid works. Uh, what kind of file, Pete? What kind of file? Engineering, kind of, engineering <laughs> files that can be shipped anywhere in the world, and this can be fabricated wherever dolphins are stranded. Thank you. So, thank, you. thank you for being here. Thanks, guys. Besides support from their community, the International Fund for Animal Welfare and the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, I'd like to recognize Paul Fusil, engineer and inventor, for continued technical assistance with this and many other invent teams. Thank you, Paul. Our next two awards are for teams that have received U.S. patents in 2016. Before we recognize the inventors, though, I'd like to introduce you to Joyce Ward, who's going to say a few words and will assist in the presentations. Hi, good afternoon. All right, I, do I hear excitement in the audience out there? <laughs> I understand you all had a pep rally yesterday, and I'm so sorry that I wasn't here for all of the experience. So maybe you can help me out by making me feel like I was there yesterday. <laughs> As Lee mentioned to you, um, my name is Joyce Ward. I serve as the director of the Office of Education and Outreach at the United States Patent and Trademark Office. And I always tell people that I feel like I have the greatest job in the world, and that's because my job and my responsibility is basically to go out, work with students, work with teachers, educators, parents, to encourage and inspire invention. And that I cannot think of a more exciting thing to do. As Lee mentioned earlier, um, you definitely inspire me. I am so excited about the numerous projects that you've put together by your hard work, your true grit, your determination. It's the same type of spirit and energy that we see in people who file for patents. It's also the same type of spirit, spirit that we see um, with inventors who are inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame or who receive the National Medal of Science and Technology and Innovation. Um, it's the same type of energy and spirit in each one of you. I want you to know and believe that you have that in you. Whatever you put your mind to, you have the ability to make a reality. Uh, invention, innovation, intellectual property, it's all about ideas. But the important thing is what you do with those ideas. What are you going to make? What are you going to build? How are you going to implement that? And that's what our office, the US Patent and Trademark Office, does is it supports and fosters innovation. And we look for ways that we can help and encourage and inspire uh, young people uh, just like you. 
uh, I saw amazing, amazing work uh, going on. Um, I learned this morning about gum removals from the floor. I learned about ways to detect um, uh, uh, conditions in cattle. I started, <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's a North Carolina team. And I confess, I am from North Carolina. So you have a special spot in my heart. <laughs> uh, I also had the opportunity to talk with a group of young people yesterday from Georgia, I think from Drew. Uh, charter school, yes, okay, up here. <laughs> and, uh, and yes, and to learn about uh, their project uh, for uh, detecting people and pets in cars. And again, I mean, just the ideas and the fact that you had the grit and the determination to take those concepts and turn them into something tangible and something real. It's amazing and it's something that you should be very proud of. And I encourage you not to stop, keep going. Find what you really enjoy doing, find the work that you really love, and then do it. Pursue it with all your heart. Don't um, concern yourself with failure. We learn so much when, we d when things don't, all, don't go the way that we think they're going to go. So I just encourage you to keep going, to believe that you can do it, and to never, ever give up on your ideas and your passion. Thank you. Yeah, yeah right there. So um, thank you, Joyce, for your words of encouragement and for being here today. And I'm from North Carolina, too, so no wonder we get along. <laughs> so um, our first patent award today is going to be presented to the SOAR High School Invent Team. And uh, Dr. Peters is going to be accepting the award on behalf of the team. And Dr. Peters, I want you to tell the team that I have their bracelet with me. So we have um, this award for you to take back. And we're going to let Joyce and you have your picture taken. Okay. Very nice. And a teachable moment here. This is a design patent. It protects the way <laughs> an object or a device looks and the ornamental, the ornamental features of it. And this is actually the first design patent awarded to an invent team. So thank you, Dr. Peters. <laughs> this is a list of inventors for the SOAR patent. And uh, I think this is extraordinary in that Dr. Peters and his son Daniel are both listed as inventors here, um, as well as the, the teachers um, and other mentors on the team. I'd like to give a special uh, thanks to attorney Adam Stevenson from Scottsdale, Arizona. Adam provided pro bono legal services to the SOAR invent team. Adam also provided pro bono services to the Cesar Chavez High School in Arizona that received a US patent in 2014. So even though he's not here, let's give him a big round of applause. Our second patent award today is going to be presented to the Natick High School Invent Team for their remotely operated vehicle used for search and rescue. The team's teacher, Doug Scott, will be accepting for the team. And we would also like to recognize members of the team if they are here to come on down with Doug. are so quiet. And it, <laughs> you guys are great.
The Lummel and MIT program would like to recognize the support in the patenting process provided by two fathers, John Van Amsterdam and John Weiner. Thank you. Now we're going to take a little transition here. Tony, where are you, Tony? So Tony is going to maybe ask a few questions of the Invent teams, 2017 Invent teams, while the panel and I get set up to talk with you all. Tony, I think. Thank you, Lee. Uh, one more big round of applause to those three teams. Going through all of those processes, I know we, we talked about with the Sturgis team starting in 2013. Um, what year did SOAR have an invent team? Four, four years ago. So that this is a four-year journey to the design patent. And Natick, what was your year? Oh, wow. A good year. <laughs> wow. So, look at that. Something was in the water that year. <laughs> uh, so th this is this is a four-year journey. So uh, we really hope that for all of you, the invention journey, uh, you know, this isn't the end. This is really just the beginning. Uh, uh, exactly what Joyce Ward said. You know, uh, keep going. Don't stop. It's it's not over today. Uh, just a quick show of hands. How many teams have uh, already filed for a provisional patent? Uh, what about teams that have talked about it or are considering filing for a provisional patent? Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, w please reach out to uh, Lee or myself or, you know, talk to, to Joyce about this if you're interested. And uh, we're, we're happy to help you and, and help you learn more about the process. I was just going to say, and I neglected to say, I do have a few materials in the back there, some books just on the basics of filing a utility patent, um, design patent. We've also got some information on trademarks, and we've got some really fun inventor trading cards for you. Um, there are just There's an assortment back there. If any of you really want the whole collection, just send me an email. I'll be happy to send you the entire collection. <laughs> Enter is going to be on your trading cards. I think, that's a, I, I think that's a wonderful idea, and I'd love to explore that with the teams, especially those with patents. That is our basic requirement. You have to have a U.S. patent, and um, we, I, I think that's actually a wonderful accommodate. idea. We can accommodate. We, we should talk about that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. So, I forgot the clicker. Almost organized. Hey, let's get situated. So I'm very pleased to have with us today three of my very favorite um, Invent Team alumni, but you guys will figure out that all of you are my very favorite Invent Team alumni. Um, but these just happen to be my very favorite that are sitting up here with me today. Um, we're going to hear from Desiree. Clara and Olivia about what they're doing today, what their journey has been since they were here in this audience um, at Eureka Fest. And uh, we're going to ask them a little bit about maybe their mentoring and internship opportunities and some of the things that help to move them forward in their schooling and in their careers. So I'm going to ask each um, of the inventors here to introduce themselves, and then we'll go into some questions. And we're definitely going to have time at the end of this panel for questions and answers from, the, from you all, OK? So Desiree, yeah. tell us about yourself. Sure. Um, so I was actually a part of Lumelson MIT Invent Teams in 2007, so 10 years ago. Makes me feel old being here now. Um, <laughs> but we were here with a solar-powered biodiesel processor. Um, and we, we used our grant money to actually buy a bus that we used to, um, to use the biodiesel that we were making. Um, we also later got two buses donated to us, um, and we also somehow ended up with a, a Volkswagen Rabbit. So we were running, we essentially started our own biodiesel fleet at our high school, 
Uh, and then after I graduated, the team continued uh, and they actually built a small one liter version uh, biodiesel processor with all of the components, the, the um, reactor and the, the fil the, uh, all the lines, all the plumbing and the um, rinse station were all transparent and it was all um, just fastened to a piece of plywood. And so that was actually used as an educational uh, kind of platform to teach people and teach, go to other schools and teach them about, you know, how the biodiesel process works and how they could maybe start up their own project uh, at their own school, which actually did happen. Um, they actually, the, the team then did file a patent for that one liter biodiesel processor, um, and I'm not sure where it's at right now. I haven't, I haven't unfortunately kept up with it, but I think the, continu the team is continuing, which is really nice to see. Um, so after Lemelson, MIT, and Vent teams, um, I actually went to school here at MIT for my undergraduate. Uh, I did chemical engineering and uh, also did a, a minor in energy studies. Uh, throughout my, my time here, I actually did have a few classes in this very lecture hall. Uh, so How does it feel being back? It feels good. It feels nice to kind of be on the other side for once. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I had some uh, freshman and sophomore classes in here. Um, really good memories in this classroom. Um, and, and so I also did a few um, internships, which I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit later um, through, throughout college. Uh, and after college, I, I started up with an MIT uh, startup company out of Dan O'Sara's lab. It was actually doing hydrogen storage. So they had, um, they had designed new anode and cathode catalysts that you can put on either side of a silicon solar cell, drop it into a beaker of water and expose it to light, and it spontaneously splits water into hydrogen and oxygen and you capture the hydrogen for energy storage. Um, we did an assessment, it would take about 14 to 15 years to be able to get the efficiency up high enough to get it to market. That's not what I, our investors wanted to hear, so we went through a few technology pivots in the company um, over the next couple years, and ended up working on flow battery technologies, so this is what we're doing now. Um, so we actually had you know, enough PhD science uh, expertise in-house to design a new uh, chemistry to go into flow batteries. So we identified a lot of the advantages of flow battery technologies um, and, and their, their use in the uh, energy storage for grid, for the grid space. Um, but with a lot of the existing technologies, a lot of the existing chemistries are very acidic or very basic, so they tend to be very corrosive, which means you need to make the entire system out of very high, high cost materials. So we actually designed an aqueous based electrolyte, um, which is using active materials, which are very low cost. You know, I think uh, Dan Sadaway always says, if you want to make something that's as cheap as dirt, you need to make it out of dirt. Um, so we actually used you know, very uh, in environmentally benign and uh, you know, materials that are very easy to find uh, on, on Earth. Uh, so um, so we, you know, we have, I have I think about six patents in, in that area for the flow battery technology. And uh, we are to the point now where we're actually starting to think about producing the battery, which is amazing to have gotten that far in just four years. Uh, usually that, that sort of technology takes a couple decades to get from you know, coming up with a new idea to actually uh, getting it out into the field. So that's where we're at now. And um, so not only on the chemical engineering side, but also doing a little bit of project management for the company, uh, understanding more of the business side, how to, how to get this thing to market, how to start uh, getting the supply chain in base, and how to start building the factory for these battery stacks. So that's where I'm at now. Yeah. Clara, where are you now? Uh, well, it's hard to follow Desiree, but... <laughs> uh, my ears on me. <laughs> my invent team created a portable water sanitation system that was modeled after the conditions in Haiti. And it sits in my classroom right now because I'm now a teacher. Uh, at the same school that I, I was in a team student with, and it's wonderful. Uh, wait, 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 wait. What did you say, Pete? Uh, I wanted to clap for that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So for Desiree, it's nostalgic being in here. I see it every day, and I, I have teachers who taught me across the hall from me, awkward. <laughs> at the very basic. Um, after I graduated high school, I went to University of Florida. I majored in environmental science and I graduated a little early I, and my friends were all still in college. Uh, I didn't know what I was going to do. I did not have a job. 
and I did some calling around and I found an internship with the city of Oakland Park in their urban planning department. Uh, I was accepted into the urban planning um, master's program at UF. After my internship, I decided, oh God, I don't think that's for me. <laughs> uh, so I took a leap and I figured, hey, I'm young enough to make mistakes and my dad will cover me, right dad? Um, so I quit the internship and I started working for the city of Oakland Park um, in their, I think it was like a daycare kind of, and I did not like children before, <laughs> I didn't. And I ended up getting a phone call one day from my advisor from my event team and she told me there was a job opening. I'm like, I don't like kids. Uh, <laughs> and she's like, just try it, you're doing a great job. And so I applied anyways and I got in and now I'm teaching biology there and I, I love it. I did. Olivia. Um, well, I'm probably the youngest of the three, but I actually just finished my freshman year at Babson College. So not in technology, I'm actually an undecided business major. So my invent team, it's a long, it's a long story actually. Um, my invent team, <laughs> <laughs> I was the technical lead on my invent team. We built a multifaceted robot. It was kind of in two parts. One part would traverse across the ice and the second part, which was an ROV attached to a tether, which had a camera, would go under the ice and carry out the search patterns instead of a diver. So if they thought, if the fire department thinks that someone's fallen through the ice, they need to send divers down even if there's no one there. So we didn't want to risk the diver's life. We wanted to have this robot take that risk out of the equation. So we did that. You could actually control it using an Xbox controller, which was really cool. Um, and you know, I finished that in sophomore year of high school and didn't expect to hear about it again. And then I believe, what month was it? It was April or May of my junior year. And you I got a phone call, didn't you? got a phone you? call saying, hey, you want to go to the White House? And so, yes, when that opportunity happens to be there, you, you grab it. And so I did present um, our invention with my teammate, Caitlin Sweeney, at the White House Science Fair in 2014. One of the best moments of my life. <laughs> So that was fantastic. Then I graduated high school, and I was thinking of doing engineering, but actually decided that after all this time spent with the Invent team, that helped me realize that I didn't want to be the engineer. I wanted to be the person leading the engineers forward, being a project manager. So that's why I decided to go into business and entrepreneurship, and I probably will end up taking engineering classes at Olin um, College, which is attached to Babson College, but they offer engineering certificates. So. Who knows where I'll end up in the future, but I know I do want to continue marrying that connection of technology and business together. Um, so we'll keep track of you. <laughs> um, well, actually, I'm going to go back here. Uh, the picture in the center is of um, Olivia introducing a young girl to the Invent Team project at the White House. So that was, um, that was really, um, every time we've gone to a White House science fair, it's been very, very exciting. But I think uh, that science fair stands out to me because there were so many young women. And uh, they were um, positioned right across from um, a group of brownies uh, that, that, that wore their little tiaras, and they really kind of stole the show, but it was, it was a great <laughs> opportunity to share with uh, uh, the, the, young, the young children in the White House, and especially the young girls. So thank you for doing that. So um, we're going to uh, just talk a little bit about um, mentors and the importance of mentors in, in your lives, your school lives, in, into your careers. And um, I was talking to, with Clara earlier this morning of, about the importance of uh, Ms. Rhonda Flynn, uh, her high school teacher, um, and uh, the Invent Team uh, facilitator. And um, I was wondering, Clara, could you just maybe share a little bit about um, that experience of having Ms. Flynn as a, as a mentor and now having her across the hall from you? Um, still awkward, but <laughs> <laughs> she wants me to call her by her first name, but I can't do it, I can't. Um, 
when you look back at your life, or some days I sit you know, after a long day and I think about the people who inspire me or who make a difference in the world or in my life, I always think of Rhonda Flynn. Um, she was a phenomenal teacher and still is. And I felt so, um, I don't even have words to describe it, just grateful and thankful for uh, having her as an advisor and for her telling me about the Invent Team program. And um, it didn't stop there for my relationship with her either. I went on to college. I would call her weekly, tell her that I'm struggling. She would say, you'll be fine. And I'm like, OK. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and if it was not because of her and the work and support and just she's like a, a mother in, of a, you know of some sort because on the event teams you spend a lot of time with your advisors I bet right some of you nine ten o'clock at night still and um, she would feed us that's important right yeah that's very important <laughs> I think psychology says that that builds attachment yeah um, <laughs> I'm, I'm attached if there's pizza um, but. Till this very day, whenever I have an issue, she is one of the first people I go to to ask for advice. Just the most kind-hearted, giving individual I've ever met, and I try to aspire to be like her every day. I fall short every day, but that's okay. Um, I, I, don't, I don't even have words to, to describe her and what she's done for me. And once again, without her, I, wouldn't have, I, would, have, I would not have started teaching. Um, and her believing in me when I didn't believe in myself. And I guess she could see through the facade I did like children. I just didn't know it. <laughs> Thank you, Claire. <laughs> That's right. Did you have any important folks that helped you along the way? Yeah, I guess I, I haven't you know, gone through the process of actually asking someone to be a mentor, but yeah, I've definitely had a lot of people that I've looked up to along the way, um, especially the, the teachers that I had during the Lemelson MIT um, process. They were, I mean, in high school, that was, that was just huge, having those, um, those teachers that just had this excitement to, to do something different and, and to be a part of that project that, you know, that we were saying that, like, hey, we, we want to do something more hands-on. Like, we want to do like, more of a long-term process rather than like, a one-day experiment in the classroom. Um, so it was, it was nice to yeah, have someone who was willing to stick around with you for like, late nights like that um, and, and drive halfway across the United States to pick up a bus. <laughs> uh, but yeah, and, and the, my the, biggest that thing. That you bought on eBay sight unseen. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it was, it was military-owned, so we knew it was well-kept. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, and it was uh, the biggest thing about, you know, for, for me is just having someone there who's always willing to kind of push you a little bit further. So I'm very much an introvert, and I, uh, I guess I, I struggle to kind of break past those barriers sometimes. Um, but it's, it's great to have someone there who knows that you can go further and is willing to kind of like gently nudge you, and then you, you get that momentum, and you're like, yeah, okay, let's keep, let's keep doing this, you know? And especially someone who encourages you to keep questioning the status quo. Um, you know, really, the biggest thing that's been drilled into my head is always continue to ask why and, and why not. You know, question the status quo. Why, why are we doing things the way that we are? Why are we not doing it some, some better way? And that's how you come up with these new ideas. You, know, you, you see a problem, and you think of a better way to solve it. And that's what all of you have done. And so continue doing that. Continue asking yourself why. Every single day, and, you know, as you continue to go throughout life and, and get more exposure to different things, you're going to see people struggling, or uh, you're going to see you know, things that, that could just be done so much easier. And, and you know, don't forget to ask, well, why not? Why, why, why can't we do it a different way? And, and figure out, figure out what that way is, or figure out some solution to it, uh, and, and put your stamp on it, put your name on it. <laughs> Thank you, Desiree. How about you, Olivia? Oh, well, you, you know my mentor, my number one mentor very well. Mr. Scott has, um, he's been there, he's the guy who got me into everything that I do now. I was planning, I was in freshman year, and planning to be an English major, not that there's anything wrong with being an English major in college, but uh, you know, I was sitting there and then 
went to this after school girls robotics day at the end of freshman year in high school. And he was there. I ended up signing up for one of his tech classes and that led me to hearing about um, the Invent Team program. And I joined pretty late actually. You know, we only had a few months left until we had to wrap it up for Eureka Fest. But the entire time that I worked on that Invent Team project, he was always there saying, you can do this, you know, it's okay to fail, get those deadlines in. And, you know, he has just inspired me in every single way. Um, I, I am at Babson, I am doing what I love because of him. He guided me and said, you know, you are, yes, you are a girl and you can be confident in tech. Um, you can do anything you set your mind to. And I've worked with him over the past few years doing all sorts of projects, but he's still to this day, is my number one mentor. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Scott. You. So, um, can each of you uh, tell me uh, and tell the audience what maybe your number one takeaway was from the Invent Team project? What did you take into your future with you? Hmm. Who wants to go first on this one? Uh, well, let's see, for me, I guess I'll, I'll start. <laughs> um, I guess for me, I knew in high school that I wanted to get involved in alternative energy and alternative fuel. And um, I guess at the time, it just it didn't seem like it was as widely used as it is today. You know, it's had 10 years to establish itself and, and really get out there. Um, but, you know, I, I would just said, you know, it was, it was one of those why not moments. Like, why can't we help, you know, to implement it? Why can't we be running some of our, our buses at our school on biodiesel, like why can't we be a little bit more renewable and a little, a little bit more sustainable? Um, so yeah, that was, that, for me, I guess it was, if, if you're questioning it, then you know, take action. Uh, and that, that's you know, what we did. And I'm starting to see that now in many different areas. You know, as I continue to learn more about, uh, about renewable energy, about energy storage, uh, about sustainability. Uh, right now, I'm actually doing some pro bono work this summer uh, for, for my graduate program that I'm doing now. And it's actually working on how to get the Internet of Things integrated into agriculture. So all of you that had, are doing farming work um, or cattle work, uh, feel free to get my contact information or I'll get yours. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, just seeing, um, you know, again, there's there's... There are ways to be doing things more efficiently than how we are now. There are problems with you know, there being less farmers, and so there are less people running, uh, you know, trying to do the same amount of work on 2,000 acres um, and trying to get us to have enough food on our plates you know, so that it's available at the stores. Um, and, and so like, how do I help? How do we get you know, maybe the machine-to-machine -machine communication out there for them, and, and how, to, how do we make that how do we make that happen? And, and trying to get the right companies then to come in. And you know, right now we're working with a telecommunications company in Canada and, and how to get them integrated into making that a possibility on, on some of the big farms. Um, so yeah, just taking that idea and trying to actually get it, you know, not only creating a solution, but getting that solution out there. Uh, so it really taught me you know, not only to really work in a team and, and really problem solve, but also how to you know, take that action and take the next step and, and how to educate people or how to, you know, approach a company and, and make a pitch and get, you know, that, that presentation experience because um, it, it's something that you're going to need no matter what field you go into or what you end up doing for your career. You're definitely going to use it. Great. Thank you. <laughs> what about you, Claire? What did you take away from your Invent Team experience? Well, I like uh, that Desiree said uh, that you guys should take action. And with that, I think you should always keep an open mind um, and keep uh, hold on to your inventive spirit. So when I went to college, I uh, graduated with an environmental science degree. But the reason why I chose environmental science and I focused on water uh, was because of the invent, uh, my inventing project. Um, and the many applications it can have and how it can help save lives. And I wanted to do that from the scientific perspective. Um, and I kept an open mind. And next thing I know, I am now trying to lead my own invent team. Um, and students, just like you guys, hopefully next year, I'll have some students wearing light blue shirts and khakis to an <laughs> audience. Uh, Oh, 
Olympia? Probably the biggest takeaway um, from the event team is that this is really hard. What you guys just did, I know this is kind of like the big finale, but it, it's not the big finale. It will follow you for the rest of your life, which is a good thing because for me, this event team experience has opened so many doors that I did not expect it to open. I remember my interview for my internship this summer. I mentioned that I did this event team project and the interviewer just leaned forward and said, you did what with the Levelson MIT Foundation? What is this? And was just absolutely intrigued and you can strike up a conversation with anyone about it. I don't know how many of you are graduating this year or have graduated, but. How many, how many graduated just this month? Oh. Or, yeah, that's a lot. Congratulations <laughs> to you guys on graduating. That's incredible. But you will find people as you do icebreakers in college, you know, it'll be say one interesting thing about you. Use this as your one interesting thing about you. I know there are many other interesting things about yourselves, but this is a huge deal and you need to recognize that. So what would they say? Hey, I'm an inventor. Well, that, that's really good. Or you could say, hey, I built this really crazy invention and I just presented it at MIT and everyone's jaws will just drop. <laughs> and they'll all be in awe and say, what, you did what? And it's great. It really has. It works, huh? It works for that. Yeah. And it works for okay. you know, any kind of networking, connections, and just start that conversation with anyone, adults, other students, peers. Do you, do you have this on your resume? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah? Oh, yes. I do, too. Do you, Desiree? Oh, yeah, yes. Oh, God. It was on your resume for a long time. I, I know. definitely. I know you do. <laughs> wow. LinkedIn, too? Oh, of course. Okay. Get a LinkedIn if you don't have one yet. They're very useful. Okay. Very useful. Hey, well, we've been talking for a little while here. Um, do you think maybe they have some questions to ask us? What do you think? You guys have some questions for Desiree, Clara, and Olivia? Yes, sir. We've got some mics here. Hold on. Okay, great. I think we have a question up here. This question is specifically for Clara. Since you're now an Excite Award recipient, how does it look different having been a student not too long ago and now being the teacher in charge? Um, I now understand what it's like. I, did they call it herding cats? Is that what it is? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I get the how difficult it is to get a group of students together and to get them inspired about something. But I also understand how important it is for the idea to come from them, from being a student. I can empathize with them um, uh, when it comes to that aspect. But it's totally, totally different. But every day I try to put myself in their shoes because I, I kind of remember what it was like to be them. So. Good, good question. Thank you. Uh, another question? Oh, I see right up here. Thank you, Adam. So what's the biggest challenge you faced in your career and have you, how have you overcome it? Is <laughs> <laughs> Me too? <laughs> yeah, so I guess I'll start with that one. Um, so, so this flow barrier technology that I briefly mentioned um, is a huge system. Um, so right now, I think it's not really cost effective for us to go into the market until it's at the megawatt scale. Um, so going through kind of the scaling challenges with that sort of a technology and that sort of a system um, is huge because you, you get things that you know are going to scale and you think are going to scale, but some of them don't. Um, so each time you kind of scale up a technology like that, you're, you're changing the design or you're, um, you know, in some aspects, in some areas, you might have to kind of start from scratch. Um, but so getting, I guess, going through that whole process of, of okay, great, we've designed a new molecule. Now how do we build the system to go around it? Um, and then, you know, how do, how do you start pulling in all the other aspects of, of the business and of getting supply chain spooled up? That's, that's one of the big things is when you're small, so if you're looking to kind of start manufacturing the, the new technology that you have, it's hard initially to find a company that's 
that's going to be you know, willing to put in a lot of time and effort to kind of take that journey with you. So you really need to be good at making that business case to them and saying, you know, this is where we're at, this is where we think we can be, this is how much money we think you will make in this process if you take this journey with us. Um, so again, just you know, understanding kind of the big picture of what you're doing as well, um, understanding what the, the business case for you is and what the bus business case for your supply chain is going to be as well. Because um, you know, that's what's another really big factor in your success is getting someone to make that material successfully for you and, and at the quality that you need uh, and, and make sure that they're, you know, they're happy in the process and they're not gonna drop you or, um, but also keeping yourself protected as well. So having secondary suppliers in case they do fall through. Uh, that's been one big challenge recently. Claire, do you have any challenges? Every day. Every day. <laughs> but, uh, but I don't think my biggest challenge has uh, happened yet. I think that'll be in the upcoming year. Uh, so this first year of teaching, I've been observing a lot and I've uh, soaked in information from my students. I constantly give them surveys like, hey, did I do this okay? They're like, no, miss, we didn't get it. <laughs> um, but that's okay, because next year it's going to be totally different. And the, my challenge next year will be um, breaking down those traditional um, classroom barriers. I want to teach biology and invention in the way that you guys have done this project over the past year, um, because I think that this is the most effective way of teaching anything. I, I know you guys are probably thinking you learned uh, communication skills, you learned how to manage each other, how to manage yourself, um, whoever the finance leads were. I'm pretty sure you know more about budgeting than anybody else in this room. Um, and to the, the teachers, wow, uh, wow. I'm sure you guys have learned a lot too. If you didn't know how to utilize the equipment, that, that's new to you as well. Um, so I'm excited about my new biggest challenge. Um, thank you for asking that question. I felt really good getting off my chest. <laughs> <laughs> Olivia. Um, so in terms of challenges for a career, you know, I haven't, yes, I'm doing an internship right now, and yes, I'm working hard at that internship, but it isn't a full-time job yet. So my college career, my education is my full-time job, and probably the, my biggest challenge related to that would be deciding what exactly I wanted to do because I you know came out of invent teams thinking oh engineering mechanical engineering electrical engineering let's do all the engineering things and be one of those superpower stem women and you know I am still that superpower stem woman inside I just decided that I'm much better when I'm leading people and not you know I love physics chemistry is not my love but <laughs> physics is still up there for me um, I will still continue to follow tech and everything that it does, but I know that, that making that transition from a very technical mindset to how do I lead people and still make it easy, how do I translate what the engineer is saying for the everyday person to understand? Mm -hmm. And making that transition for me was really hard because I just, I had wanted to do engineering for, you know, two, three years. And then having a period of a few months where I was like, I don't know what I want to do with my life. And then finding this place to land at Babson where there's a huge, entrepreneurial and innovative spirit was really great for me. So that was probably my biggest challenge, but as Clara said, I have many challenges ahead of me in college <laughs> and my career beyond. Great. Do we um, have, I think we have time for two more questions. Let's get this side. Over here. Questions? Cool. Yes, maybe? Dominic, can you ask a question? Yes, I did. Thanks. You're welcome. I, I got nothing. <laughs> Dominic. Okay, that's okay, Dominic. We have Dr. Peter. Dr. Peters. Right down front here. Do you want to ask a question? So, um, you know, we, we try to figure out how to attract more women and young girls into STEM pathways and now into being inventors as well. And I'm wondering if there was anything uh, as you were growing up that, that influenced where you are today and what are those kinds of things that could be helpful with even younger students? Um, 
I have two brothers and they are highly intelligent and very logical minded people and they're both uh, scientists. And um, I am one of those people, if you tell me I can't do it, you would have bet, I'm gonna do it. <laughs> so uh, I saw them and what they were doing and I was very inspired by what they were doing. So I think providing a base for young girls to feel comfortable um, in taking on challenges. Because somewhere down the line, and I experienced this too, like the transition going into high school, where, where you start to think to yourself, oh, am I, am I good enough? You, you definitely are. Uh, oh my god, math? You can do it. <laughs> oh my god, college? Apply. Yes. <laughs> Go. Um, and like Desiree was saying, take action. Taking action or giving them ways or steps to take that action is really important as well. So uh, the Invent Team program really was a good base for me and um, helping me stay within STEM. Yeah. So keeping me uh, within the, the program, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'd like to, I think I'm independent. I like to try to be independent. So I like to, I mean, I really got into the engineering field because I was like, I want to fix something. I want to do it. I want to make it myself. <laughs> um, I mean, that's not the real story because when you get down to the real world, you're always working with teams. You're always working with people. Um, but I think for me, I guess it was really, uh, I think to tr try and get, I mean, there's a stereotype that women are emotionally connected to certain things more than men. Um, so I guess if you are able to present them with a project that they can be emotionally connected to, I think that can really help them to, to get into that, that mindset, that engineering field, or that science and technology and engineering field. Um, and uh, I guess that, that was for me, because I, the emotional connection that brought me to wanting to do alternative energy um, was actually when I took a trip. I took two trips to Alaska, and one was in 2004 and one was in 2006. And I went to one of the same glaciers on both of those trips. And uh, on the second trip, it was, they were both in August, exact, exact same, same time of year. But on the second trip, the glacier was about 400 feet further from the same spot that I stood. Um, so that for me, that was my emotional connection to climate change is real. I need to take action. I need to do something about it. Um, and so that was what really kind of drove me into, I'm going to be an engineer. I'm going to design something, build something, create something to help us, help everyone uh, try and fix it. Great. Dr. Peters had a question. Oh, wait, Dominic. Yeah. <laughs> now, I know this is actually going to be a really, really basic, simple question with possibly a very sensitive. Are there any instances in your work where you thought back to a specific memory of being an invent team and thinking, oh, this is just like that time in invent team when we did this? Is there any, did you ever have a time like that working where you are now? Oh, 100%. I mean, well, I mean, you guys have real jobs. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> for, for me at college, we have a, at Babson, we have this, course called FME, which is every first year has to take Foundations of Management and Entrepreneurship. Basically, you spend the entire first semester doing all the build-up, and then the second semester, you launch your own company. And as soon as I was put on a team with people that I didn't really know, I was thinking, this is just like Invent Teams. I have to, you know, you got to get up there, you got to start doing this and this and this, and here's a Gantt chart, and here's this, and Nobody understood what I was saying, but it reminded me a lot of Invent Teams because that is one of the biggest elements of anything you do in life, teamwork. You will always be around people. You will always have to deal with people that you don't like. You will always have to find a way to reach that common goal and come together for that, and I guess that was, that was my biggest experience that reminded me of Invent Teams. Great. I Thanks. have a solution for you about working with people you don't like. It involves shoes, yeah. So, <laughs> um, I I definitely have uh, challenges getting some of my students to work together in groups cooperatively and effective and efficiently. Um, 
And I had an instance this year where I had a team, they refused to work together because they did not like each other outside of class. So I'm like, hmm, what did my admin team do when we first met each other, really? Uh, um, as a project manager of my project, I really loved building that team spirit. So we took a trip to a, a local park, and we had a little picnic, and then I, uh, I started this icebreaker, like everybody took off their shoes, and one at a time we were blindfolded, and the other group members had to tell us where to find our shoes. So take off your shoes if you ever if you ever have problems <laughs> getting along with your teammates. I like that. That's a good idea. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> Dr. Peters, you had a question. So um, a lot of the Invent Team students from us some a few years ago. Um, Got, were lucky enough to have their first choice of a university to go to, but some of them didn't. They, they may have had to take their second or third choice. Are you seeing with your peers, people having to take second choices or third choices more often than you thought? And how, how have you seen um, young people dealing with that now? I mean, it's definitely so, I did not expect to, for me, I, you know, Babson wasn't my first choice initially because it's actually 15 minutes from my house. <laughs> and I, I love my parents. And I said, OK, if I go here, you can't just drop by uninvited. <laughs> and so they made me that promise. And I ended up going there. And I love it. Um, but I wanted to go far away. I wanted to go somewhere where I could do, go to a big engineering school and all these Ivy Leagues and everything. I mean, even my sisters applied to many American schools, and they both went to McGill University in Canada and have had incredible careers so far. But they were incredible students, and they just did not get into the schools because of extracurriculars or what have you. So I think if you are faced with that second or third choice school, you can either go there and take advantage of what is there, maybe get your gen eds done at that school, and then see if you can transfer, or Take a gap year. There is nothing wrong with taking time off to figure out exactly what you want to do. Um, even if it's just half a year, a lot of schools have delayed start programs, or they call them gap programs, where you either go abroad, or uh, and the school pays for it, or you just don't start until January, because there are students that actually graduate in December, as I found out. Um, but even just taking advantage of whatever resource it is, and you may be disappointed initially, but there is always a silver lining. There is always something that you can do at whatever school you end up at. Or even if you're just doing a gap year and you find a great job or internship, you will always find something to learn from. Good advice. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. So um, we're going to bring the question and answers uh, session here to a conclusion. and. Um, I know that Desiree does not recognize this picture, but I know where Desiree is in that picture. Uh, this is the uh, Invent Team group picture from 2007. Desiree, you're on the back row, about five from the left, and you have a white shirt on. <laughs> so I thought that it would be great to end this session by taking a group picture of you all. Now, I was also thinking about what it's like to herd cats. And I originally told Tony, hey, let's go outdoors to the amphitheater, and this amphitheater, and take a group picture. And he says, Lee, that's not possible. We might get half of them out there, but um, the invent teams really have something very important to do, which is uh, set up for the showcase. So what we're going to do, where is, where is Connie? Connie's going Connie's to gonna try to take our pictures. We're going to stand up here. We're going to move to the center. And we're going to see how we can get a group picture right where we are. So thank you all for being here today. Thank you, panelists.